Good evening. Welcome. This evening, we're going to talk about matters of murder, five cases that are still unsolved. Let's begin. Number five, the Icebox Murders. June 23rd, 1965, police arrive at 1815 Driscoll Street in Houston, Texas after a call to do a welfare check on Fred and Edwina Rogers. When police get no answer at the door, they do a forced entry. Searching the house, police find nothing unusual, but notice food sitting on the dining room table. One officer opened the refrigerator and found what appeared to be numerous cuts of washed, unwrapped meat neatly stacked on the shelves. The officer later recalled that he thought the meat was that of a butchered hog. As the officer was closing the door, he noticed two human heads visible through the clear glass of the vegetable bin. The heads were those of Fred and Edwina Rogers. What the officers initially thought was unwrapped cuts of hog meat were the couple's dismembered limbs and torso. Police later discovered the couple's organs in a nearby sewer. The organs had been removed, cut up, and flushed down the toilet, while other remains were never found. Topsy showed that Rogers was killed by a blow to the head with a claw hammer. His eyes were gouged out. Edwina was beaten and shot execution style. What little blood was found led to Charles Rogers' bedroom, their son, where police found a bloodstained keyhole saw, but no trace of Rogers himself. A search for Rogers was launched and a warrant was issued for him as a material witness to the crime, but he was never found. The case remains unsolved and still an active case. Number four, the Grimes sisters. December 28th, 1956. Barbara, 15, and Patricia, 12, Grimes, opt to view a screening of the Elvis Presley film Love Me Tender at the Brighton Park Theater. Both girls have been described as being inseparable sisters. The theater was located approximately one and a half miles from the girls' McKinley Park home. Barbara and Patricia are presumed to have approximately $2.50 in their possession at the time they left their home, and Barbara, having been instructed to keep 50 cents of the money in her zippered of her wallet, should the two girls opt to view the second screening of the film scheduled to be shown at the theater that evening. It is unknown how the sisters actually traveled to Brighton Theater on that particular date, although they had either walked or traveled by bus to the destination on previous occasions. A friend of Patricia's named Dorothy Went would later inform investigators that she had been seated behind the girls with her younger sister during the film. Although Went and her sister had left the theater at the intermission of the double feature screened at the Brighton Theater that night at approximately 9.30 p.m. as they had done so. Dorothy saw the Grimes sisters purchasing popcorn and the two had seemed in good spirits. Both sisters stayed in view the second screening of Love Me Tender. Those meant that they would expect to return home at approximately 11.45. When the girls did not arrive home by midnight, the mother, Loretta, sent the older sister, Teresa, and the brother, Joey, to wait for them at the bus stop located close to the family home for their arrival. Three buses had driven by without either of the girls getting off of the bus. Both siblings returned home, having by this already successfully contacted the girls' friends in hopes had been at one of their addresses. And upon seeing the return of Teresa and Joey to the family home without the sisters, Loretta Grimes filed a missing persons report on her daughters with the Chicago Police Department at 2.15 a.m. On December 29th, Mr. sparked one of the largest missing person cases in the history of Cook County. A citywide search for the girls were quickly initiated, to which hundreds of officers were assigned full-time. Cook County officers were assigned to surrounding suburbs 
and task forces devoted solely to locate the sisters were formed. With the ground search initiated on December 29th, before boasting of hundreds of volunteers, police conducted door-to-door -door canvases throughout the Brighton Park and numerous canvases of rivers and dredged. In addition, more than 1,500 flyers were distributed to local homes and parishes. On January 22, 1957, following a rapid thaw of a recent snowstorm, a construction worker named Leonard Prescott spotted what he later described as being these flesh-colored things behind a guardrail as he drove along rural country road named German Church Road, approximately 200 feet east of the Country Line Road, frozen bodies of the Grimm sisters. The girls' bodies laid upon a flat horizon section of a snow-covered ground directly behind a guardrail which intended for about 10 feet before the incline of the embankment of Devil's Creek. Barbara lay on her left side with her legs drawn slightly up towards her torso. Patricia lay on her back with her body covering her sister's head and her head turned sharply to the right. It's believed the sisters had been likely driven to the location, either tossed or lifted out of the vehicle and placed or thrown behind the guardrail. See that was performed the next day, showed that the girls were sexually assaulted, bludgeoned, and stabbed what, what they believed was an ice pick before their bodies were discarded. Prior to them finding the girls' bodies, there was multiple sightings of these girls from being at bus stops to hotels to restaurants to stores but none of them could be confirmed that month the girls were laid to rest side by side at the holy cemetery in fort worth illinois on january 28th all fees for the service were waived by the funeral home. This case has never been solved and is still an active case. The night of October 12, 1974, the Perrys had an argument about the car tire pressure. Perry told her husband that she wanted to pray alone inside the church and they parted. Bruce Perry became concerned when his wife hadn't returned home at 3 a.m. and called the Stanford Police Department and reported her missing. Officers, however, from Santa Carla County Sheriff's Office went to the church and reported all outer doors were locked. Campus security guard Stephen Crawford, a former Stanford police officer, claimed to have found Perry's body around 5.45 a.m. October 13th in the church. She was face up with an ice pick that was sticking out of the back of her head. Though the handle was broken off and was missing. There was also a sign of a strangulation. Police also noted that Perry was naked from the waist down. A three foot long altar candle was inserted into her vagina and another placed between her breasts. The case remains open and active for many years and was never officially closed nor treated as a cold case, according to the Santa Carla County Sheriff's Department. In 2018, however, Crawford was defined linked to the murder following an advanced DNA test. On June 28th, as police arrived at Crawford's residence with a search warrant, Crawford locked his door and committed suicide with a pistol before he could be arrested. Case number two, who killed Jeanette De Palma? The afternoon of Monday, August 7th, 1972, 16 year old Jeanette De Palma left her home in Clareview Road in Springfield Township, New Jersey, telling her mother she was going to take a train to her friend's house. She did not arrive at her friend's home or return later that evening. Her parents filed a missing persons report with the Springfield Police Department. 
Six weeks later, on September 19th, her remains were found atop a cliff inside the Springfield Quarry. This occurred after a local dog brought her decomposed right forearm and hand back to its owner. According to several witnesses at the scene, Jeanette's skeletal remains were surrounded by a series of strange and possible occult objects. Descriptions vary, but the most common agree upon accounts state that the remains were found inside a coffin-shaped perimeter of a fallen branch and log, and inside the perimeter were several small makeshift wooden crosses. Some Springfield residents claim that De Palma's remains were actually found laying on a pentagram surrounded by mutilated animal remains. Law enforcement authorities have denied that this was true. Further conversation was aroused when it, it was discovered that the body had been found on a cliff known to locals for several decades as the Devil's Tooth. The Springfield Police Department began an investigation into Janetta De Palma's death after an autopsy did not reveal the cause of death. Her remains and clothing showed no evidence of bone fractures, bullet wounds, or knife strikes. No drug paraphernalia was found on or around the body. For undisclosed reasons, the coroner suspected that the strangulation was the cause of death, leading the Union County Prosecutor's Office to treat the case as an unsolved homicide. The coroner also discovered unusually high amounts of lead in the remains, but no explanation was found for the occurrence. Early in the investigation, the Springfield Police Department received tips regarding homeless man living in the woods near the place where the body was found, but prosecutors later decided that he had nothing to do with it. Around two weeks after the discovery of De Palma's remains, several newspapers, including the Star-Ledger and the New York Daily News, began reporting that she had been a victim of an occult sacrifice. The coverage was surreal. Rumors about the case set off panic in several counties, which were recovered from shock of John List murders, which occurred only 10 months earlier. Investigators continued to attempt to find leads, but due to the incomplete police work, along with inconclusive stories told by friends and peers, the case eventually went cold. This is still an active and an unsolved murder case. Case number one, who killed Amanda Tussing? On June 14, 2000, 20-year-old Amanda Tussing vanished after leaving her fiancé Matt's house in Jonesbury, Alaska. At around 11.30, just a few hours later, Matt found her car abandoned along Arkansas Highway 18 five miles east of St. Francis Bridge. Three days later, Amanda's body was discovered in a rain-swollen ditch near the lake. There was no signs of sexual assault, although police believed she was suffocated and thrown in the ditch. The medical examiner could not confirm that. He did determine that she did not have water in her lungs, suggesting that she was dead before entering the water. Detectives believe the killer was someone known to Amanda. They believed the man impersonated a police officer, pulled her over, lured her out of the car, and drove her to the Big Bay Ditch, where he murdered her. They believe the man could be a serial killer who has done this before, judging by the lack of evidence found at the crime scene. However, there has yet to be determined as the rain may have washed away crucial evidence at the crime scene. This case is still an unsolved murder, and hopefully still fresh in a lot of people's minds. So if you know anything on this case, please contact the authorities, let them know. Even something that you believe may not be very important might be important to them. Thank you for watching my videos, and you guys have a great night. Stay safe.